Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our virtual museum community town hall. How are we doing? Presented by the CCP Visual Arts and Museum Division. This is the second in AGMAM series of museum talks online. I'm Yael Buencamino of AGMAM, and I will be the moderator for today and tomorrow's sessions. We all find ourselves in a highly unusual situation that there are no guides or for our handbooks that we can follow. Museum workers all over the world have tried to cope as best they can with this unprecedented situation. What we hope to do in the next couple of mornings is hear from our members, our museum colleagues, about how the past couple of months has affected their museums and staff, their programs, exhibitions, collections, and plans for the future. Through this sharing of experiences, we hope we can learn from each other and from our conversations with our colleagues that we can help each other forge ahead. In the talk last month, we heard from curators and directors of art and anthropological museums. Today, we have with us speakers from other fields, museums of science and history. We are very grateful that Ms. Maribel Garcia of the Mine Museum and Mr. Brian Paraiso of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines have agreed to speak to us today to share with us their, their own experiences. But before I introduce our first speaker, I'd like to remind everyone that we will be taking questions after the two talks. So um, please send in your questions through the Q&A box on Zoom or through the Facebook Live comments. Um, I think there's a slide for that to show where, um, where you can send your comments. Okay. Um, our, our first speaker this morning is Maria Isabel Maribel Garcia. She's the managing director and curator of the Bonifacio Arts Foundation Incorporated, an art and science foundation that conceived, created, and operates a science museum, the Mind Museum, which everyone knows, and I'm sure most people have been to, and the BGC Arts Center, a performing arts center and it also runs the public art program of Bonifacio Global City. Her concurrent work engagements include being executive director of the Asia Pacific Network of Science and Technology Centers. She's chairperson of the World Wildlife Fund Philippines. She's vice president of El Refugio Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Pinta Art Museum. She's on the board of Alliance Francaise de Manit and a science columnist for Rappler.com. Her weekly column, Science Solitaire, has been running since 2012. Um, Maribel will be speaking to us today about the future and how um, museums can contribute to a better normal. Um, please welcome, oh, I don't know how you will welcome her. Please welcome Maribel Garcia of the Mind Museum. Thank you very much, Yael. And I think we do this to welcome each other. <laughs> so hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. I've decided to focus on how museums could help create a better normal um, from two standpoints. First is personal, uh, so as not to go crazy. With all these things happening, uh, we are in the strangest of times. And uh, being grounded in the sciences, I know things will never be the same again, that's for sure. So it's better to aim for what's next and maybe even help make that next thing better. That's why I focused on uh, my topic, which is how could museums help create a better normal? So I'm going to share my presentation with all of you now. Um, so there, how could museums help create a better normal from now looking at this strange planet that's now shaped like a coronavirus to something uh, much better. Um, 
And I think the young people have a much better vision than uh, the previous generation of what this better planet is. And it's going to be a big part of, my, excuse me, my presentation. So first of all, why think of not just a new normal? Why even think of a better normal? Well, the features, the features of the old normal will not be back in the same way we can count on. So why not aim for something better? That's very, it's very simple. It's just easier to think that if you're going to have something different, why not have it better? Number two, the old normal was narrow, limited, or even flawed in not just a few things about what learning means. Um, we're very particular about this in the Mind Museum because it's a relatively new science museum compared to science museums around the world. We were just open in 2012. We started planning for it in 2007. So we were very deliberate that when we started planning, we were asking everyone else around the world, our, our peers around the world, it's the big, the biggest science museums to so the, the smallest science museums, asking them, what would you have done differently if you were to build a science museum now? And they all said, what we knew about learning then is so different from what we know now. And it's because of the neurosciences. The golden age of, of neuroscience is happening in the last 10 to 15 years. And we know so much more about how the human mind learns uh, as compared to before. That's why the Mind Museum was guided by that in the way um, it was supposed to encourage and inspire people and how to explore things for themselves and learn. Another reason I could think of was, well, because museums, by definition, should inspire the life of the mind, regardless of the times and regardless of what's happening, even if it is this brainless creature called a virus invading our lives. And while we're at it, I, maybe I'd like to point out, from my perspective, what are some of the, old, the problematic features of the old, old normal for museums? Um, from where we stand, um, me and other science museums uh, I, we know of and uh, our peers, environment and science, quote unquote, uh, in quotes, were just topics and advocacies of science museums and special exhibitions in other museums, which is, um, which is the prevalent mode, like um, an art museum would have a science topic uh, science museum would always be the go-to for anything that has to do with environment or science. And the old normal had a perceived dichotomy between formal and informal learning, with museums perceived as icing on the cake, just a treat, like a bonus or an add-on. That's why we have to insert ourselves in education, like field trips are inserted uh, in, in education. But the human brain does not differentiate between informal and formal learning. There is no such dichotomy in how the human mind learns. Number three, delivery of our purpose, of uh, the purpose of museums were mainly facility-based. Uh, everyone in the museum who works in the museum knows this, their exhibits and in-person learning programs. Number four, strategic directions rest mainly on higher management. This is the predominant mode, not just, I don't know much, about here, but um, it's a, quite an issue around the world in terms of running museums that they're, they're run like uh, the way governments and uh, many top heavy corporations are run. They, the higher strategic direct directions really just mainly rest on top management, whatever you call that top is. And number five, when something like this happens, whether it's war, pandemics, or what have you, museums wait. Keyword here is wait, and I'll explain more about this later. Museums wait, like everyone else, until things improve. That's the, the problematic features of the old norm. So first we have to accept that the old normal got us in this mess. It really did. Uh, being in the sciences, and I say at the bottom of my slide, thank you, Chabeli, because she's one of the team members who translated um, the statistics into uh, these graphics. Yes, the old normal got us here. Humans destroyed and took around 66, 66% of the planet. Land mass and natural land habitats. They're now towns. 
estates. Humans altered 75% of the marine environment, over 33% of our land mass, and 75% of freshwater resources are devoted to feeding just humans. Humans slowly and silently massacred 60% of animals since the 70s. We are consuming about two planets, almost two planets now. And unless you have been uh, insensitive or been sleeping for the past uh, 20 or so years, we only, I mean, for, since the beginning, we, you should notice that we only have one planet. So we're over consuming it and really eating it. And we're really breaching it. We have breached its capacity for uh, so many years now that we only have 10 years left before things become truly irreversible. So really the old normal got us in this mess. Whether you understand the science or not, that fact will not change. So here it is. Uh, if you see approximately three to four new infectious diseases have emerged each year and the Hi, everyone. I think we're just having a little bit of a problem with the connection um, with, Marib with Maribel. And I'm sure we're all very eager to continue hearing what she has to share. Um, even the beginning Hello. portion of her talk was already very exciting. Um, Hello. Oh, there. I think she's back. Hi, Maribel. You're back, but we can't hear you. I was cut off. Which part? Yes. When you were talking about um, when you were talking about how the planet will be um, uninhabitable in like uh, okay. uninhabitable 10 okay. years. And then um, the slide was, this is not a war. It's a reckoning. Okay. Sorry about that. I, I could not see on the screen if I'm connected or not because it's a full screen. Um, the, uh, okay, wait a minute. So, uh, 
で This is, is this the slide? That one, yeah. Yes, okay. So it's not a reckoning, it's a war. It's not a war, it's a reckoning. We are just settling the, cons the consequences of our own actions. Um, that's why I'm very annoyed that people keep calling it a war. A war uh, confronts an enemy that has a battle plan. The virus doesn't have a battle plan. It doesn't even have a brain. So we are reckoning with our own actions. Um, so I, my team and I uh, thought of some possible directions towards a better normal. Um, and, like, and like what we have been talking about in the museum circles and Rika was mentioning during our practice, we are all experimenting. But there are certain things that are emerging as patterns, not just locally, but around the world among museums. And foremost of which is whatever the nature of your museum is, the people planet nexus matters now more than ever. So maybe take that nexus and tell that story in science, in history, in art, whatever uh, the nature of your museum is. At the end of April, around the world, um, many museums uh, across continents bonded together to declare this. So I'm part of a working group uh, of museums around the world that are veering away towards the, the mainstream before that science museum should be neutral. We are all declaring, at least the, the groups that we are forming in the network, that there is no neutrality when it comes to planetary health. There is no escaping the fact that we ruined it. So what is next for us? Uh, so that's the direction we're taking uh, across uh, certain museums around the world who feel the same way as the Mind Museum does. Number two, uh, another possible direction is we champion connected learning, including through pandemic born objects. Um, I think museums, all of our museums stand out because we stand for connected learning and not fragmented learning, um, which is the way schools are built, you know, uh, through subjects and degrees <laughs> and certain things. It's not connected learning across the disciplines. And I think museums are so good at that, extraordinarily good at uh, connected learning. Uh, I was very, I was very um, interested and intrigued, fascinated to know that, you know, from even telling the story of a mask, you can go back to the pandemic flu and see this, you know, the unusual costume sa mga, sa mga masquerade balls, <laughs> yan. That was their mask, okay? That was their PPE during the flu and the plague. Um, so doctors came in like that. I don't know whether, you know, if I were a patient then, I would you know, die quicker if I see someone like that. But uh, that's the history of the mask. So it was very interesting to even see an object which museums are very good at in exploring its history, take us across history, the history of health and the history of how even in the history of fear and how we cope with it. Number three, another possible direction is um, we remember and we strengthen our purpose because it's the same purpose. We, you either the champion the arts, the sciences, or history. It is the, the delivery that would be different or would have to expand. Right now, we're uh, aside from the obvious tools like Zoom and webinars and online materials, um, I was thinking, I was just talking to a few friends of mine in, uh, in companies who manufacture. I said, maybe, you know, the museums in the Philippines could have a coalition and we can all, like the artists and history, we can repackage and relabel your product so that we contribute, cultural institutions can contribute whatever it is they have that can be connected with the products that you have. And maybe in, you can even include QR codes in those museums so that when the labels are so interesting that people would notice and then they go to the museums and if they support that kind of work maybe they could also support those kinds of museums so we're even exploring those things i was struck by that because i'm a person who if i find what is written on something very interesting i really really read it and especially if it's funny or interesting or out of the ordinary uh, maybe we will notice and museums are so good at that you know for how for influencing people, for influencing what people will see and look at. 
Am I still okay, Yael? You can still hear me, okay. Number four, this is uh, second to the last, identify people in your team who could help steer the org's direction and empower them. Um, in our team, we're very conscious about, we, we, found, we found this term called holacracy, and one of our team members, Christopher, found this out. That um, no one person can really know everything. <laughs> so even if I had the foundation, we decided that we all should harness our talents and ideas. So even our playbook when the pandemic happens as early as the end of March, we were able to do first town halls to see how everyone is feeling and then contribute to what could the, the universe of possibilities out there under the pandemic so they could all contribute. And you know, these millennials and Gen Zs, it is no secret that they're more agile with tools. They're far more agile than the previous generation. And they're so excited to, to uh, use those tools. What our role probably the previous generation is, is to, to remind them that tools should always be tied to purpose. Uh, so we're trying, uh, we've been at it since last year, actually that kind of setup. So, and we're, we're finding out that we, it's a more uh, participative, it's a lot richer, and mahahalata pag wala kang ginagawa. <laughs> Kasi everyone is involved. <laughs> everyone is involved and leading in so many projects that it will really be so obvious if you're not doing anything and not contributing. So, my last um, possible direction is... You know, I said that maybe one of the problems is that museums wait like everyone else. And, I, and I'm talking about this with other museums, uh, our peers around the world, that we are so good at designing things, right? So even we, we can design ex waiting experiences while we wait for a vaccine or while we wait for the, for the government to say museums are okay and in what form. We can design the wait. If there's a doomsday clock that the scientists are so good at, you know, every time uh, the superpowers are uh, are so close to pushing that button for a nuclear war, that that doomsday clock moves. Maybe, maybe museums can design a yay day clock, you know, uh, so that we can help the public make sense of the way that it's not just staring into space or just making do or in drudgery or being depressed about it. Maybe we can design the weight in terms of uh, visually, in, times, in terms of uh, lifting spirits. De depending on what is happening in the world, in the developments, we can, we can design those things uh, along a timeline. Uh, that maybe we, people can see in a mural, uh, in projected images somewhere, or some, somewhere they can tune into. We can really, really design the weight. We are designers of experiences. We shouldn't forget that. Um, so in the end, um, for the Mind Museum, we did at the outset when we did our pandemic playbook to include that anything we will do will be geared towards helping create a better normal and not just to cope and not just to be relevant. I think relevance will naturally come if you know and always remember your purpose, which is essential. Meaning museums are essential, we provide the kind of learning that no school, no other think that can do. So it's just the delivery that will matter. So with that, I'd like to end my presentation. Thank you. That's it. Thank you very much for that, Maribel. It was very interesting. Um, I love, you have a lot of innovative ideas and I can imagine um, you and your team coming up with all these, um, with, with all these maybe solutions or um, visions for a better world. And I really like that. Um, uh, thank you very much for sharing that with us. Thank um, you for having we'll me. We'll talk a little more. 
You're welcome. Um, we'll talk a little bit more with you after the presentation of Brian um, because questions are coming in, people. Um, and I'd like to remind people that um, they can send their questions for Maribel and for Brian in um, through the Q&A box on Zoom and through the Facebook live chat. Thanks, Maribel. Um, for our next speaker, um, we'll now deal with history museums. Um, Mr. Brian Anthony Paraiso is the Supervising Historic Sites Development Officer of the National Historic Commission of the Philippines, managing the operations of 27 history museums across the country. He received his Master's of Arts in Cultural Heritage Studies, summa cum laude, at the University of Santo Tomas Graduate School in June 2016. He studied visual arts at the Philippine High School for the Arts in Mount Makiling, Laguna, and received his Bachelor of Fine Arts degree, major in painting, cum laude, from the University of Santo Tomas in 1997. Brian Paraiso has worked at the Metropolitan Museum of Manila, the Balay Taliambong Museum and Art Center in Negros Oriental, and the Office of Special Studies Philippine Navy. He currently serves as the NHCP representative to the National Committee on Museums, NCOM, of the National Commission for Culture and the Arts, the NCCA. Um, Brian will talk to us a little bit about how, how to make history museums relevant during this time of COVID-19. Um, everybody, please welcome Brian Paraiso. Thank you very much for inviting me for this talk for this morning. Um, it's a very timely issue that we have to discuss with regard on how do you make history museums relevant at this point in time when the whole of the country is suffering from uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. The question of relevance has always been in the mind of the NECP, especially for uh, for us who take care and manage the operations of history museums, which are basically heritage houses where our um, heroes lived, uh, some areas or some sites where important um, historical events have happened in the past. So how do we make that relevant to the audience then? And how do we make it relevant now uh, when audiences are not allowed to visit these heritage sites. So I'll share you some of uh, the projects and programs of the NECP with regard on how to address this uh, the pandemic. So for a backgrounder, uh, the National Historical Commission of the Philippines was strengthened by its own charter, Republic Act 186 in uh, around 2010. So we were uh, mandated to become the primary government agency responsible to promote Philippine history. Um, there are five divisions actually in the NECP, but four divisions are designated to conduct research, um, carry out commemorative events, undertake restoration and conservation of historical sites, and manage shrines and museums. So here are some of the um, divisions concerned. Uh, the first would be the Research and Publication and Heraldry Division, which is the historical arm and publication arm of the NHCP. The Historic Preservation Division, it undertakes the preservation, protection, and development of uh, historic sites and structures, while our Materials Research and Conservation Division uh, prescribes the restoration and conservation techniques that are needed to protect the country's movable and immovable heritage. Um, for my division, the division that I belong to, the Historic Sites and Education Division, 
uh, my uh, division, we handle the maintenance and operations of national shrines, monuments, and landmarks as history museums or interactive history museums. And we also take charge in the conduct of the various commemorative events and other educational activities related to the birth and death anniversaries of our national heroes. For us in the Historic Sites and Education Division, we believe that history museums are no longer uh, just repositories of artifacts or memorabilia of heroes. We believe that they can become living centers of learning through the, in, through the use of innovative exhibits, the use of interactive displays and new technologies. So history museums now are serving as a supplement to classroom learning since uh, most of our museums, well, all of our museums contain um, vital information and visuals and artifacts that are not necessarily seen in textbooks or can be seen in, uh, in just mere slides or presentations. So the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, we currently have 20, 27 museums all around the country and we are still expanding so to present some of our museums, for our Metro Manila cluster, we have six museums. So I hope that you, um, those who are in Metro Manila are able to visit these. So one is the Museo Nio Serizal in Fort Santiago, Museo Nio Apolinari Mabini in PUP Manila, Museo ng Katipunan in San Juan City, Museo Ni Manuel Quezon in Quezon City. Uh, our two new museums are the Presidential Car Museum, which is quite near the Museo Ni Manuel Quezon and the Museo El Deposito in San Juan City, which is uh, adjacent to the Museo ng Katipunan. And it features the old um, underground tunnel or underground water reservoir of the, uh, during the Spanish period. For our Cavite cluster, I'm quite sure um, you've seen the Museo de Emilio Aguinaldo in Cavite, Cavite because it's uh, one of the central um, sites for the Independence Day celebrations. Then there's the Museo ni Baldomero Aquinaldo, also in Kawit, and the Museo ng Paglilitis ni Andres Bonifacio in Maragondon. For our Laguna Batangas cluster, we have the Museo ni Jose Rizal in Calamba, Museo ng Dibingan sa Ilalim ng Lupa ng Nagparlan, or the Underground Cemetery in Nagparlan, uh, the Museo ni Miguel Malvar, Museo ni Apolinar Mabini in Tanawan, Batangas, Museo ni Leon at Galicano Apasible in Tal, Batangas, and Museo ni na, uh, Maria Marino at Felipe Agoncillo also in Tal, Batangas. For our Central Luzon Cluster, we have three museums, uh, the Pamintuan Mansion, which has been transformed into the Museo ng Kasaysayan Panlipunan in Angeles City, Pampanga, and then we have the Ramon Magsaysay Museum in Castilleo, Sambales, and the Museo at Aklata ni Justado Makapagal in Lubao, Pampanga. For our Bulacan Cluster, we have the Museo ng Republika ng 1899, which is in Parasoin Church. Uh, the Museo ng Kasaysayang Pampolitika in Casa Real Shrine, also in uh, Malolos, Bulacan. And then we have the Marcelo H. Del Pilar Museum in uh, San Nicolas, Bulacan, Bulacan. And our newest museum is the Museo ni Mariano Ponce in Baliwag, Bulacan. For our Visayas, Mindanao, Naga, and Bato cluster, we have the Museo Nio Serizal Dapitan in Zamboanga del Norte. And then we have the Museo ng Kasaysay at Pamanang uh, Boholano in Lawai, Bohol. And one also, one of our new museums is the Museo ng uh, Kasaysayang Pang Ekonomiya ng Pilipinas in Iloilo City. And our last two museums will be the Museo ni Juan at Antonio Luna in Badoc, Ilocos Norte, and the Museo ni Jesse Robredo in Naga, Camarines Sur. So in 2012, the NHCP, we had decided to undergo a modernization process. So because we decided to take, uh, to take into account that there is a changing need for, for our museum, for our museum visitors, and we wanted to become attuned to the latest trends in museum design and museum exhibition. So we decided to update all of our texts, our narratives, and we, we decided to incorporate infographics, interactive terminals, our audiovisual presentations, 
we also use augmented reality and uh, e-learning facilities in our museums. So these are some of our museums that have been already updated and uh, modernized for our uh, new viewers. And to further promote uh, Philippine history and to inculcate awareness and appreciation for, um, uh, for our Filipino heroes and their ideals and their um, philosophies, NACP Museums, we also undertake educational programs that cater to the interests of our stakeholders. So it's basically the usual, the lectures, the workshops, the film showings, plays and concerts, exhibitions, and community development programs. But 2020, when it rolled in, it has proven to be one of the most challenging years for us since we had to face um, natural disasters and calamities. The first of which would be um, in January 2020, we witnessed the eruption of Taal Volcano in Batangas, and this forced the closure of our Batangas Laguna Cluster Museums. So one of our main goals then was to undertake the rescue efforts of uh, to remove some of our movable artifacts from possible damage due to the heavy ashfall emitted by Taal Volcano. And come March 2020, we had to endure the enforcement of the quarantine restrictions in Luzon, which forced the NHCP to shut down its main office in Manila and to cease the operations of all of its museums and all of its activities due to the COVID-19 pandemic. But despite the challenges, the NHCP, uh, because we wanted to fulfill our educational mandate, uh, we decided to use alternative learning platforms afforded by social media. So um, the NHCP, um, actually prior to uh, these uh, natural calamities that have happened, we were, we were already producing various documentaries on the lives of uh, eminent Filipino heroes like Jose Rizal, Apolinario Mabini, Andres Bonifacio, and Gregoria de Jesus. And we also tackled contemporary issues such as martial law. So these documentaries, they're available over at YouTube for free. And we often invite teachers to use these as material. So they could use the, this or present these documentaries uh, while teaching. And we have also seen that it's also valuable that we try to simplify um, aspects of, for example, uh, one of the laws that we implement as the NACP is the flag and heraldic code. So how many people would be able to understand um, the law if it's just plain um, written law? So we decided to use infographics to make it more uh, sensible, more readable to our viewers. So it's more understandable on how or what you have to do to respect the Philippine flag. Uh, last Independence Day, we also presented Independence Day by the Numbers. So this is an online exhibit on the NHCP Facebook page. So we presented Independence Day. How, what is the history of Independence Day? Did you know that independence are, uh, the Declaration of Independence in the Philippines happened at 4.20 p.m. on June 12th? Only a few people know that, that it happened in the, af in the afternoon. And that uh, the, uh, uh, the Declaration of Independence is actually 21 pages long. So you can just imagine how many the people then having to listen to a, a 21 page um, declaration. Uh, by, uh, by our president, by our first president. So our online exhibits on, a, on the NACP Facebook page also tackle not only historical information, but we also tackle cultural and heritage icons. Uh, one exhibit is the Terno, Filipino regal dress, which presented how, uh, how the Terno, the, the traditional Filipino dress started from Spanish colonial times and, and how it developed until modern times. 
uh, one of the things that we are proud of as NHCP is that we have very young curators. For example, our Museo ni Marcelo H. Del Pilar in Bulacan is uh, handled by a very young curator and he presented this online exhibit, Pamana Atinta. It shows drawings of heritage sites in Bulacan. Uh, these drawings were made by the, by the curator himself. So we are proud to have curators who are very, um, uh, very idealistic, very creative, and they are able to do their own graphics as well. Sometimes we also deal with um, sharing uh, selected recipes. For example, this one, these are selected recipes uh, by Jose Rizal in, while he was in the Pitan. So we presented how, how to cook chili miso soup or salted, uh, salted fish, uh, which are some of the favorite foods of uh, Dr. Jose Rizal while he was exiled in the Pitan. Uh, since there are also um, no heritage tours happening now, um, our museum in Museo ng Katipunan decided to show the different heritage sites in San Juan City that people pass by every day and they might not know that these heritage sites um, are, in their, in, are in an enclave of the metropolis. So we also found out that um, one of the things that would help make history relevant to people, to our audience, to people now in quarantine, is is to make them participate in an online exhibit. So, for one, we have this history at home exhibit uh, launched by our Museo El Deposito in San Juan City. So, he and our curator there encouraged the viewers to share their personal collections that they valued so that it could be um, shared for the appreciation of a wider audience. So most of the artifacts that, that uh, the participants shared with us are water-related objects. And um, we also feel that it's also necessary to share the collections of the museum that uh, that are currently stored because of the um, pandemic. So for example, our Museo de Manuel Quezon in Quezon City, we are showing some of the different um, ternos, uh, clothes used by Aurora Aragon Quezon and some of her personal uh, items that she used uh, to beautify herself. But we also, um, some of our curators also still um, use traditional puzzles such as guessing games and word hunts that they could be utilized online. So these um, guessing games and um, uh, word hunts can be downloaded by uh, viewers and they could answer these on their own uh, time. We also continue with our webinar series uh, through conference apps like Zoom. So we came up with lectures and discussions on history and other multidisciplinary topics. So for example, in Museo El Deposito, we um, had a discussion on water sanitation and, set and sustainability and the history of how water sanitation was valued in the early part of the Spanish period. And we also tackled the philosophy of Rizal with regard to uh, independence. So in closing, we, the NHCP, uh, we decided to use graphic software, available online apps and social media to allow the NHCP to think of alternative ways to make Philippine history relevant. So it is also vital to understand that you need to be creative and you need to think out of the box for solutions to attract the visitors to the online version of your museum. Uh, but we, we do not lose sight that what matters for us is that we continue to instill values, awareness, and appreciation for Philippine history and heritage through a variety of platforms. And we find that this is also very important to um, engage the public, to invite them again to step inside into the physical setting of the museum and to have another direct communication with the artifacts when the COVID-19 situation 
um, levels down. So I would like to invite everyone to visit um, all of our social media pages, our, our Facebook, our Instagram, our Twitter, and our YouTube so that you, you're, you'll be able to um, participate in many of our exhibits and our activities online. So thank you very much for the time. Thank you for that presentation, Brian. That was really very interesting. Um, you have a lot on your plate with 27 museums to handle yes. and all over the country. I can't yes. imagine um, the panic that went through your mind when you realized you had to close down 27 museums all Seven at the museums. same time. Yes. yes. <laughs> It's just one of a big, uh, one of the biggest struggles that you have to do when you manage that number of museums, and how do you maintain uh, public engagement still with uh, the closure of the, the physical museum? Yes, definitely. Um, I like I. Um, speaking about the museum closures, um, this is a question I'd like to address to both of you. Um, how? how did you handle that closing down of both your museums? Because you have um, existing programs, right? You have people who have, especially both of you, you have very, um, you have very popular museums. They're museums that people go to for field trips. Um, and you have people who have been, you know, have booked way ahead of time and your staff was ready to deliver the services. How did you handle the closing and um, how did you communicate with everyone, both staff and audiences? Um, uh, well, for the NECP, um, we are well, actually our first um, major blow was actually the start of January with the Ta'al uh, uh, the Al volcano uh, eruption, because one of our most popular areas would be uh, the Patangas Laguna area, since uh, it contains um, the Rizal Museum in Calamba, and we have two beautiful museums in Taal, which were directly affected by uh, the, by the eruption. So, and then this this uh, the COVID nineteen pandemic rolled in. But in a way, I could say that when the eruption happened first, we were able to see how um, how vulnerable our heritage sites are with regard to these uh, unexpected turn of events. And we could well, we could only try to mitigate as much as we can because for a government museum, um, we have limit. Well we, we, well, we have limited funds with regard to how to operate a museum. Um, in truth, most of our museums are limited as well in personnel. So what we say is tulong-tulong na lang, ano, uh, tulong-tulong na lang po tayo sa pag-aayos ng museum. Sometimes we have, all, uh, in a museum, we have only three to four personnel to carry out the whole operation. So for example, when uh, the Taal volcano exploded, only we we had to rush all of our conservators to go to those two Taal museums and to get all of the artifacts that can be carried by hand and transfer them to a safer place. Uh, with regard to the COVID-19, it was a, a great surprise because um, around, I think middle of March it happened and then we had already bookings for tours and we had to explain to our um to our audiences to our to those who have already booked for their tours that um we have to understand that it's necessary uh for their safety and for the safety as well of the staff that we uh, that we carry out these restrictions for the meantime and we can only plan for the for the next year since if, if i believe most of our museums will be closed until either November, December, and would start operations by January. So I think that would be would, would give us lead time to prepare for uh, for our museum visitors to come by again. Maribel, are you also looking at the 
uh, are you also looking at an end of the year reopening of Mind Museum? Well, in our case, we closed even before we were mandated to close. Um, we, because we are a science museum, we, we knew what this was all about and, mm -hmm. and we knew it was going to be for the long haul. So um, the immediate uh, direction, which was, was based on our philosophy was, if we're going to be in, uh, in this in the long haul, we'd have to make an entirely different playbook. And I wanted to be assured as the leader that my entire team is on board on this new revolutionary thing that we would have to do. So we took stock first. So uh, everyone understood, the public understood that if they had bookings, we all had to close down. Safety first for everyone. But then the team, I have a very lean team. We're only about 29. So we had to take stock and say, okay, this is what's happening. Um, we're, we're going to suffer in terms of revenues and income for the next so-and-so months. Let's do an alternate universe. So what do we do right away? So I also had to get their pulse. So we, we, we even sent out a survey on how they really feel. If, they're feel, if the staff feel really being, they feel like they are supported in this time, personally, emotionally, and all that, because I wanted to be assured that everyone is on board. If we're going to do something really difficult, I wanted everyone to be ready for it, emotionally, and all that, so that nobody says, oh, no, I wasn't part of that. <laughs> and now we're in this really big boat that's rocking. So I wanted everyone to be all in. So that's what we focused on first for the first two weeks uh, during the lockdown in March. So that by April, we were already laying out our new playbook. Um, and very grateful for the team for being open to that. So we are looking at not opening, even if the government mandates us to be, until we have assessed, just like we locked down before the lockdown, that we will not be the source of any outbreak, considering considering how this thing is not yet done. Okay, um, we have a few questions related to that um, that have been sent in from our from our um, from our Facebook from our Facebook page and from Zoom. Um, one of the questions is um, how much of the operation, museum operations and programs rely on ticketing income? Um, Maribel, uh, Maribel, this is for you. Given yes. that visitorship will be low in numbers yes. soon. <laughs> uh, I, always, I always surprise people when I tell them this, that our, our income from admissions is only 50% of the... Mm -hmm. The revenues of the museum very early on even i think the year after we opened we knew that about the life of museums from the ones who have come before us you cannot thrive on ticket sales alone because once deped says there's a moratorium what will happen to you once there's a big typhoon and a series of accidents that you have nothing to do with but you are being blamed for together with the rest of people whom they have to have uh, field trips for you're going to be out of the loop so we it's only 50 percent, and the rest are grants um, other projects uh, where we can champion the sciences and the arts other ways of delivering our mission thank you thanks um, Brian do you do your museums um, rely on ticketing income or are they free and supported by the government <laughs> Actually, for the 27 museums, all of our museums are for free. And wow. we rely solely on um, on our um, yearly, the yearly budget provided to us by government. So um, it's, well, it's a, well, we could say it's a juggling process when you have, when you receive uh, this so much amount from the government to run your museum. So you have to be, um, you have to know which museum or which uh, which museums need priority. For example, most of our budget would go to um, since we are heritage sites. We have to put more focus also as well on their conservation and the restoration of some of these heritage buildings. So a great portion of our budget goes there, and we try as much as possible to apportion also a part of it for our public programs and um, for our uh, online presence. 
And in truth, right now, during, the, during this pandemic situation, um, our budget was actually cut to 50% for 50 to 50% 50 from the usual budget that we received because the, the, the money that we, we had to remit back to government was used for the, uh, for, to solve the pandemic crisis. So now we are, we are trying to um, run our museums through, the on, through online portals because that's the only possible way you could run the museum at, this, at the moment. But once we try to open, we will try to see if we could um, sail by through this crisis as much as we can um, through um, a prudent use of our, of our remaining resources. Yeah, I think that is um, an issue that most museums will be having now, the, um, the limited budgets or reduced budgets because of the lack of operations. Um, but both of you, um, talked a lot about um, your online platforms and how you've used this opportunity to reach people online um, with some very innovative things. Um, I really like the games that you shared also, Brian. I have to make, I'm taking note of that so I can download it for my kids. Um, and, um, and those programs seem to be addressed to people of different interests, of different interests, different age groups. Um, and I think and I think that's what a lot of museums um, have learned through this experience, that um, there is another way to reach people. Um, is, do you have a way of tracking or seeing how, um, if people, if there's been an increased amount of traffic on your website or social media, um, are you getting feedback from people about your online presence? Um, this is for both of you. Well, um... One of the things that I'm proud to say is that most of the people I work now are very young people, actually, the, the millennial generation, then they're, they're more adept in tracking down uh, how many people are, uh, are looking over our Twitter posts, our Instagram, or Facebook. I remember when I started out, nobody really uh, focused on using social media, especially those of us who belong well, to the older to the older generation because it wasn't well well social media wasn't really popular for us but now i'm very thankful that we have this younger set of people working for uh working for heritage working uh to ensure that heritage continues to be relevant to their generation and they're able to track down how many people are coming into our website, how many people are looking over our exhibits. And this pushes us to improve what we offer. And, and we are finally seeing how important it is to, uh, well, generally most of the young today have their cell phones at hand. And so we have to consider that this is an important uh, segment of society that we need to serve and we need to serve them using the contemporary modes of um, getting in touch with them. So through social media, through cell phones, through email blasts. Yes. Maribel? Yeah, I mean, when the museum opened, it's always it's always had a digital presence, and mm -hmm. and and because I have a young team, they've always been very adept at this, and they've been monitoring this ever since we opened in two thousand twelve. Uh, what was what I was really pleasantly surprised with was um, even the birthday parties that we used to have in person in the museum suddenly shifted on Zoom. So now we have birthday parties on Zoom for kids, and we just send them out science kits. Uh, it's very funny when you do that because even the parents get involved. They're very competitive in on screen uh, in, in terms of their kids' performance during the Zoom. Uh, so it, it immediately shifted online. Um, the, my young team didn't have a, um, a very difficult time trying to make sense of it because they were born <laughs> in this generation and we allowed them to explore that world uh, even you know before the pandemic. So we're quite happy with that. Um, even our Cafe Scientific in April on Earth Day, which really honed in on the old normal, got us into this pandemic in the first place. We were very surprised that 
thousands and thousands of live uh, in terms of the loud live audience. And by the time it was on Facebook, it was in the double digit, the last time I checked a month ago, uh, double digit numbers. So I think people are ready to be, are ready to really receive content for their minds online. But I always worry about the rest who don't even have access to the internet. I always worry about that. Um, remember what Deped said, that 70% of their students don't have online access. Uh, so that's something that we, that we are trying to address now. But I cannot say it yet because I haven't finalized, <laughs> I haven't finalized uh, the, the, the project yet. But in a few weeks, uh, I will probably will and uh, let you all know. Wish us luck. Um, that's um, that in relation to what you're saying about reaching a wider audience. Um, one of the questions that's been asked several times is how are we reimagining um, museums as places of learning um, now that now that um, schools aren't going to be physically open for a while? Um, how can we support or how can we work with? schools or maybe support their initiatives to get learning out there to the students? Um, and do you have any initiatives that have to do with um, working with blended learning for schools or e-learning or, um, and, I, and I think especially the, um, both your um, institutions would be crucial to, to the curriculum, history and science, those are like, those are like these these subjects that need to be tackled, and I'm sure um, teachers would be happy for um, for any support that they can get from your museums in terms of I don't know um, an exchange of ideas or materials. Yes, we've always had the My Museum has always had an app. It's the My Museum app, and all teachers can download it and even play it offline. So all the information about all the exhibits are there. But uh, an added program to this is uh, we will have a YouTube channel. It's called Mind School Online. Uh, so this will, because all our exhibits are directly tied to the curriculum, okay. regardless of levels. So we okay. figured out a way to deliver online interactive uh, science demos and how to's tied to the curriculum on the YouTube channel, apart from other things that we're doing. So. It's funny that uh, they call it blended learning. It has always been blended learning in the head, okay? <laughs> it's, it's always been like that. There's no other brain that you get from your cabinet when you want to learn something. It's just one brain. It's always been blended. So the virus was helpful <laughs> in making us realize that we all each have just one brain and one mind. And it doesn't matter where you get the content. It's how you get it and how you make sense of it. So if there's ever one good thing that came out of this strangest of things, the coronavirus, it's making us all realize that we all are blended in the way we learn. And it includes museum learning. <laughs> yes, um, for our, the NHCP, well, I will actually accede to what Ms. Maribel said. Um, it's very important for us to understand that um, it's important that how do you how do you make mix the various multidisciplinary topics and subjects. Sometimes the problem with uh, with our learning nowadays is it's sometimes compartmentalized. This is history. This is this is science. This is art. But I think there would be a more richer understanding of our heritage and culture if we tackle these in a more multidisciplinary approach. Mm -hmm. So this is what we try to do at NECP as well. Um, for example, with, uh, with our museums uh, tackling Jose Rizal, we try to present him as a multidisciplinary hero who tackles um, history, heritage, who tackles mathematics, about medicine. So we try to blend that in with what uh, programs we have, because we want, want want them. We want people to understand that 
these heroes are not just one-sided heroes. They have multifaceted character. They're multifaceted characters, and they have multifaceted understandings. And this helps us to to have a, a better and a clearer view of the past. That our heroes all have these uh, are all Renaissance men, and in a way, we could also become Renaissance men like them. So I think. Um, if we try to use this as a as a, a way to anchor ourselves, uh, how to value our museums, mm -hmm. that would be um, we would be well. It, it would help us be more relevant, I, I believe, to uh, to the general public. Um, you you touched on um, you touched on something that. Um, really resonates with me and I think resonates with a lot of museum goers. Um, the idea of multidisciplinarity in teaching and in learning. And um, I think that's something that Maribel also touched on um, about how in the old normal, um, science and environment were just topics of museums. Um, they, but but now with the new normal, with everything, or with a better normal, we're hoping that um, we can see things in a more integrated fashion. Um, that, you know, the History Museum does have the science components to it because people are composed of all these different facets. And in the sciences, scientists, uh, in the sciences as well have has a history to it, as Maribel showed us with the masks of the pandemic. Um, hopefully that um, moving forward, um, all of us realize that the multidisciplinary natures of all our museums, although we are segregated into, you know, yeah. types of museums, but within them, there is a lot of, um, there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of facets to the topics that we cover. Um, that are relevant to people's lives. Um, there are, I think, Brian, I think there are um, pe yes. people from other history museums who are very, um, were, were very impressed by your presentation of your online platform. So some people are asking about whether um, the NHCP has support um, or can, can maybe, uh, help people figure out how to um, improve their online engagements as well, other history museums. Um, yes, um, well, for the NECP, we're always welcoming people whom, how we could help them through technical assistance. Mm -hmm. So um, all they have to do is just write to us and uh, we will address their concerns. Um, as I think it's, be it's, it's very, Good at this point in time that we try to work together as um, as a real community. We are a cultural heritage community, and I guess I am very much open to help anyone. Uh, my well, the NECP is very much open to help everyone in the museum community to um, to address how we could uh, face the pandemic together. How can we? How can we? Um, create a stronger online presence for our viewers who need who need that guidance who need the guidance of culture and heritage and history to help them along and um, well, as I said I'm very much open all they have to do is to write the National Historical Commission of the Philippines for their concerns and we will try to address them as best as we can thank you Maribel um, someone was asking um, if uh, the Bind Museum has initiative, what initiatives you are doing now that um, champion the su sustainability, um, the sciences, and that might still help you um, generate revenue? Like those birthday parties of yours online, do you generate revenue from that? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Okay. But um, a big um, a big direction we, we've always taken was to always walk our talk. That's why the Mahi Museum is a green building, a certified green building. Uh, so, so we'd like to be sustainable even in the way we operate. Um, the project that was hanging just before the lockdown was just we finished the design of a hydroponic project, the first vertical urban hydroponic project uh, for an urban place, which is BGC. 
um, we would have wanted it to be up <laughs> uh, when the lockdown happened, but um, the, it was just the design that we finished. And I was going to do, start a fundraising program for that because we wanted it to be some sort of living museum for everyone to understand that they can do this. Even if you have a little space in your condo or you have a farm, a little land where you can just do things vertically, we wanted to demonstrate mm -hmm. that. So that's part of our program uh, that we're going to roll out. And I'm trying to find people. We've already had some partners, some solar, and it's completely so solar po powered. So uh, we have zero, uh, net zero energy required to run it. That's why it took us some time to design it. So that's one of the sustainability projects. Even in the way we're designing our science kits now that we ship, that we will ship to kids, because we were all the science museums in the world when we were talking, we were so we were so worried because we we are so uh, always reminded by the newer scientists on our board on our councils that online things is not it. Okay, no matter that if it's the only thing available, it will work much, much less or even zero for younger kids. Mm -hmm. um, it's good mm -hmm. for older kids and college kids and will probably work, but not for younger kids. They still have to hold things. They still have mm -hmm. to tinker with things. So we decided that any science kits we would have to do would have to do with sustainability and recyclability so that uh, something will turn into something else when you play with it. Uh, so it, it, it took us a few weeks to design something like that. So we're now... Uh, making them uh, we all retooled so we are now uh, assembly line in the museum trying to make these things to be shipped to to complement the online learning or whatever science learning it is that's happening at home and in the barangays now are there um specific schools that you're working with um, that you're sending these kits to or um are they like kits that schools can write to you and purchase these kits? Yes, the schools as an organization can purchase the kits, but individuals can as well. So we're finalizing the avenues through which we can do this. Um, mm -hmm. even, in the way, even in the way we design the kits, it's really uh, about uh, sustainability. So it's the sky above and the earth below. So it's a mix of things where you can learn about that we are all in the same place. There's if they always say there is no planet B. There is also no species B. There is no other species who can plan out how to get out of this mess. So all our programs are geared towards that. Uh, we put it under the banner of um, the Bonifacio Art Foundation, which is the Mind Museum and the Performing Arts Center, Times a Better World. So we're just so focused on making it better. Uh, there is no other way, right? You either get depressed or try to help to make things better in the new normal. I, I love the optimism and the, <laughs> the, <laughs> the drive the to make things better. Yeah, but that's the only way. And uh, if it helps at all, we tried it internally. Uh, and if you, if you were optimistic and rally your team towards a vision that is better, mm -hmm. you have a better chance of making them work. <laughs> towards <Yeah>. better <laughs> instead of sulking at home and saying that we're all doomed and we're not gonna make it uh, mm -hmm. giving a vision where that they can aim for and they will feel very purposeful about will really help you get there yeah and i do think um people even in their own homes are looking for that for that vision of what it will be after we come out of out of quarantine when we are back out there um, and I love the idea of your hydroponics, your hydroponics display at the Mine Museum because I feel like um, if there's anything that people have started getting into during this yeah. pandemic, it's gardening and you know <laughs> making sure they have some green in their apartments or whatever. And just the realization, huh? Just a little bit and, of trivia for that hydroponics. So we have a setup in in the Mine Museum. So so all of our cup noodles now will have sometimes. <laughs> Always have vegetables now because we be grow them, right? But it's so funny because the young people, so at night, the vegetables are lit, right? Because they need light. So we have LEDs, for grow, we call them grow, grow lights. But it's a glass, diba? It's We have glass walls. So you can see young people, they're not familiar with farms. So they will take pictures. They will 
put their faces on the glass and you will notice them and, and hear them say, Oh, club. They think it's a club inside the <laughs> center right? And they're disappointed to find out oh, they're plants. <laughs> so it's very funny. <laughs> Kids think it's a club that we're trying to operate in the museum. Well, maybe you could have a gardening, an urban gardening club for the young people. Yeah, I think we're nearing that uh, very soon. So, wish us luck in trying to get it. It's just very hard to fundraise now with everyone else trying to figure out who to help. And we can understand the very generous people are trying to prioritize. Uh, so, wish us luck there. Yes. Um, I have a few more questions. I think we have time for a few more questions. Um, do you do both of your institutions have guidelines for reopening to the public when restrictions are lifted? Um, have you drafted those guidelines, especially because your both your museums are very interactive? And yes. um, there's a lot of touching happening yes. there, and, you know, especially like in the mind museum. Um, yeah. You know, so many things <laughs> to tinker yes. with. Yes, we've had that in place uh, since April. Um, and we've updated them considering the lessons that we have learned from the, our peers in Europe who have opened ahead of us slowly. We, we've had suggestions ranging from that there's a, there's a museum that opened in Poland. One of our close uh, friends there opened their museum, the Science Center, and... Um, because a Polish, a Polish company offered this anti-germ spray on surfaces that could last a year with just one spray. Mm. So they even used it. Uh, the messaging was really great because science found the solution was the messaging. Science found the solution too so that the science museum could open. But when I messaged them, including the counterpart uh, company in Finland, I, I laughed my head off because the the Finnish people and the Polish people said, "Oh, we're very we'll be very happy to help you, but we have to fly there. We don't sell the product, but we have to fly there." You know, a la Ghostbusters. I, mean, I can imagine <laughs> coming. <laughs> How can they fly here? There are no flights yet. So I said, "That's really helpful, but not really <laughs> right now." <laughs> so right now we're figuring things out, which are closer to home, probably Singapore. <laughs> There's an, an, another experimental thing that we're trying out in Singapore with our peers. So science, the science museum industry across the region and across the world are very much in touch since March, trying to figure out because we are a ha we are all hands-on people. So that's mm -hmm. our biggest concern. And but there have been zero, zero evidence and zero cases where transmission happened from surfaces. But given that we still practice, we would rather err on the side of caution. That's yes. good to know. Well, for the NACP, we are in the process of building our own um, guidelines for uh, when the pandemic ends. One of the biggest challenges that we face is how do you create guidelines, especially for heritage houses? Because as compared to modern buildings, it's we have to find to be more careful on what um, on what chemicals that can be used or what um, may, means of making the heritage house safer for visitors to come in. So we have to weigh with caution what is more, we have to weigh uh, the issues and concerns with regard to conservation of the heritage site via the, the, the health issues and the health concerns of our visitors. Um, so at the moment, we are still um, crafting it. We're trying to come up um, with a, a feasible um, middle ground. How do we make our heritage sites accessible to people to come in without um, uh, damaging any of, the, of these sites? Or most of our heritage sites are uh, made of wood. Uh, they're on a bahay na bato. Um, so we have to be concerned if we use this uh, certain disinfectant, would it have an effect on the on the surface of this uh, furniture pieces or these or the wooden walls? So we have to be uh, we have to find that middle ground before we uh, before we start accepting visitors in. 
So um, at the moment, we are trying to get uh, um, our conservators to come up with their own playbook. How are they? What are the um, what are the means or what are the chemicals that can be that can be used safely by our staff without them um, getting poisoned? Um, uh, one of the recent concerns is that as the NBI one of the NBI doctors was poisoned by a disinfectant, and so we are afraid of that happening as well. Um, it might affect not only um, the health of the person but also the environment itself of the museum, especially a heritage house. Yeah. Yes. yes. Um, I think that other historical um, museums and people with um, conservation labs would be interested in um, talking to you more about this. Maybe there can be a sharing of um, sharing of knowledge of what you've discovered so far and what they've discovered so far, what works. Um, and I think that's another question for both of you. Um, would you be willing in the future to um, share some of, you know, share uh, your guidelines, like how, as, your, as you, as you, um, as you lay out your guidelines, would you be willing to share them with other um, museums? Definitely, definitely. Yes, definitely as well. Yes, because I think as I we are a community, we should be helping each other to survive this uh, pandemic. Um, it's the only way for us to, to come in together for the next year. Um, if we lose one of our museums, well, it's a sad thing. It's a sad day for for the for the Philippine for the Philippine for Philip for the Philippines, especially. Um, well, I, as I sit in the NCOM, I know that uh, there's, there's only a few number of museums that we have and to lose one museum because of these natural disasters is, is a saddening thought. So as much as possible, we have to try to help each other survive. Yes, that yeah, that and that's one of the reason why we've um, we wanted to put these talks together, and we're glad CCP took the lead in um, hosting this one because we wanted to bring people together, especially um, even with our talks tomorrow, with our small group discussions tomorrow, so that um, we can talk about what we've done that works, so that we can um, help prop each other up with the knowledge. Because I think most museums have small teams, right? Yeah. So we can't all think of our own solutions. So learning from each other is um, is a is a great way to uh, get through this period. One of the um, thing, things ahead. that I, I'm I'm really happy about in the region, the Asia Pacific region, we came up with um, a masterclass for emerging leaders because mm -hmm. the pandemic is a great example now <laughs> on how to mm -hmm. lead in terms uh, in in the midst of extreme or high or very extreme uncertainty so we we designed a course for uh, a masterclass on zoom across the region for our members the me members of the network and i'm really happy on how it's turning out in terms of the program because we would like um the young people to have a vo voice to reimagine what that's like, but then able to have an avenue to really formally transmit this vision to the quote unquote elders, <laughs> uh, the status quo, so that they can see that blended thing which has always been blended. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that, that thing always. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you. Um. Someone's asking also, um, during this lockdown, what were the most challenging exhibits or items, components to conserve or maintain for both of you? I guess Brian can go well, ahead. Um, one of the, well, since we take care of a lot of uh, historical memorabilia, um, well, for the first few months that we weren't able to visit our museums, um, we were really extremely worried because um, we rely on, we rely that our museums are um, always, uh, must have always have, um, well, 
the air within the museum gallery should be always be um, in perfect temperature. We mm. have to maintain. So we are we were worried. Um, when do when we get back? Will we be seeing textiles that have mm. molds, or yeah. do we have um, paintings that have molds? Um, but thankfully, since we have um, well. Most of our security guards uh, who are uh, still serving our museums, they most often they open the, the air conditioning so that to maintain the, they were able to maintain the, the, the temperature, the, the, the optimal temperature in the galleries. So that was one of the biggest challenges then, is to check each and every uh, artifact that we have is still, um, it's still good. It's still uh, that it doesn't need any conservation to be done on onto it. So, so we have twenty seven museums, and we have to check each and every museum. So, thankfully, I have curators there who are able to check, and they they have their own staff who are able to check uh, on the status of the museums of their collections. And um, sad, uh, good to say, it's uh, most of most of all uh, of our collections are in uh, are good. Nothing, not no damage uh, sustained by, by by the changing temperatures or the changing humidity. Oh, that's wonderful to hear! I'm so happy for you. <laughs> well, come here. The plants, the plants had to be tended to. So, uh, the hydroponic <laughs> plants. So we, we were able to do that, and for the rest of the exhibits, we were able to as as far back as um, April, we were able to schedule the needed uh, maintenance for it, alternating staff so that they will not be too many at the same time. And I don't, mm -hmm. I'm, fortunately, I don't have the problem of Ryan <laughs> about yes. the molds of uh, yes. textile and irreplaceable objects. Um, all of our stuff are replaceable. All, all of them are. And they are childproof. Well, I, we would like to. For certain children, <laughs> and so they are able to withstand abuses. Uh, so we we are able to schedule the kind of maintenance we needed to during the lockdown. Um, we'll do one more question. Um, this one is for um, for Brian. Um, someone is inquiring about um, specific programs related to NHCP's community development. Um, they're asking um, if you, if NHCP has any collaborative programs with DepEd in the context of new directions um, for this period of blended well, uh, learning. Sorry, but well, at the moment, <laughs> um, uh, DepEd hasn't approached us yet. In, uh, well, I guess for one thing, DepEd is still. Um, this pandemic took them also by surprise. So they are still in a way trying to find their way on how to develop a better curriculum and how to um, integrate history and heritage into the curriculum. So well, hopefully, I'm um, maybe one of these days, um, the DepEd, well, as I've said, we are always open for collaboration with other departments, especially DepEd, so that uh, from what I've heard from um, a fellow teacher whom I, I know is that um, the DepEd is um, try, still trying to come up with a, with a curriculum um, that could um, address the needs of, of online learning or as they say blended learning because from the longest time I think the problem with I think the DepEd is it's still they are still compartmentalizing knowledge according to science and as I said it's it's very good if they come in uh, through a multidisciplinary approach so that well they could get the museums as a source material for for their lessons so it would be easier to learn about science if you blend it with Jose Rizal's discoveries and his writings philosophy with about uh, Apollinario Mabini and how he how he thought about independence or how he thought about um, about how to run a government properly. So I think that's important. Um, well, 
I hope all museums will, will, will be able to um, help each other. We could help the government realize how to help educate um, the young to become more um, patriotic as well as more knowledgeable on how, uh, how to live their lives properly. Or, yes. Um, yeah, I think that is um, a good note to end our discussion on, and I think that all of us um, see the value of museums in um, in education. And as Maribel said, um, we are essential. Museums are essential. We provide um, uh, different methods of learning that schools don't, or that online learning does it. Um, so when we all get to open our to open our institutions again to the public, um, I think it would do as well to remember that um, the kind of experiences that we bring to students and to audiences in general, um, allow them to, uh, to process knowledge and to receive knowledge in a different way that as they would um, if they were just looking at it online. Um, and I'd like to congratulate both of you on, on all your initiatives. It's making science and history very exciting. Um, it's great to have all these museums for kids to go to. Um, I think that, uh, you know, part of, um, part of what, what we're lacking is that um, connection, that that um that physical connection to artifacts and to the way things work like how plants grow and how the plants work um if we take everything from secondhand information like digested already for us there is a there's kind of um there's kind of it's not as easy to digest and accept as if you were encountering the actual artifacts and processes um, um, for yourself. So uh, I'd like to congratulate you on the wonderful job that you're doing with your museums to allow this to happen. Um, thank you so much for spending your morning with us. Thank you very much. Um, and um, uh, we have some questions that weren't answered, that weren't asked online, that weren't asked um, live. So we'll just pass those on to you, and hopefully we can answer them. We can answer them um, in written form for the, the people that asked them. Um, and we will see you tomorrow, as well as our other members who are joining in the um, small group discussions. And for everyone else, um, we will see you hopefully next month for the next museum talk. Um, please join, please consider joining AgMAM if you haven't joined yet. Um, membership dues are discounted for a limited time. Um, we hope that you can all join us and make our museum community richer and more diverse. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.